The views and opinions expressed in this episode of Skip the Show's Fun Night Friday are purely those of Skip the Show and do not necessarily represent the values and opinions of Cat Production Team. But then again, he's no less accurate than the crap you find on the History Channel, so he's got that going for him. This episode was previously recorded in front of an imaginary studio audience. Time for Fun Life Friday! <laughs> Alright, Hi, all you knife chatters out there. Your old pal skipped the show coming back at you again. Happy Fun Life Friday! Well, uh, I guess it's a happy Fun Life Friday for most of you, but I'm a, in a little bit of hot water. Uh, Got to print a contraction or what? Oh, contraction? Retraction. Got to do a retraction here. Apparently, last week during a Fun Night Friday, I had made a comment uh, that, uh, and I got one of my facts a little crooked. Let's just put it that way. It wasn't quite right. And uh, it was in regards to big ass bowie knives uh now i know what you guys are thinking must have had something to do with that jim bowie story well we'll get to that in a minute but that's not what this retraction is over retraction is over this knife here <laughs> the big old scimitar buoy of uh tobias's uh he, he made it and so i assume that this must be one of his favorites and uh well uh it's not really his favorite. He really likes it. He's he's proud of what he did with it. Uh, got that Spanish doubloon there in the back. White smooth bone handle. Yeah, nice cross guard. And yeah, big old knife. And uh, pretty cool. I like it. But apparently, it's it's not his favorite. It's not even among his top three which kind of surprised me. And uh, he told me I needed to go back and let you know that. And he said that soon, and very soon, he will actually speak for himself on what his top three big-ass buoys are. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. I hope you are too. But you probably won't see this one. But I guess that means that maybe one day it'll be one of my favorite big-ass buoys. Come man. I'd love to use this around the, the volcano club for chopping up fruit. Man, that'd be a lot of fun. Can you imagine just chopping through cantaloupe and watermelon and you know, skinning a blueberry with it? Yeah, skinning a blueberry with a scimitar buoy. Now that would be a challenge. I'd love to see somebody take on that challenge. I dare you to skin a blueberry with a knife like this. Anyway. Needed to get that out of the way first. So no, this is not Tobias's favorite Bowie knife. But he will show you his top three Bowie knives in the near future. Whatever that means with Tobias. Now on to something else. Now apparently some old coot on another channel which will remain nameless. But it's a delightful channel, uh, other than this one old coot, who apparently claims to be the great, 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 great somewhere or something, grandfather or granddaughter or grandbrother or grandson of Jim Bowie himself, claims that I misspoke about Jim Bowie and the Bowie knife. But then, when Tobias called him out on it, he pretty much confirmed exactly what I was getting to. That Jim Bowie's Bowie knife was not that big a deal among everybody else there at the Alamo. Matter of fact, it was pretty much a common sight. Big ass blades back then. And the thing is, is uh, when Jim Bowie supposedly... Now this is in the, in the real written recorded stuff that everyone has fallen for over all the years. They actually have this citation where apparently Jim Bowie contacts Resin Bowie who contacts some blacksmith or something and, and Jim Bowie says, Hey, I want you to make me this uh, knife 
that looks like one of them big old Mexican fighting knives. So there was nothing new about it. And basically what he was talking about was something that looked more like this than what looked like this. This is what we think of today when we hear Bowie knife. But what he had was something like this. It did not even have a guard on it. It's just a big old butcher knife with a blade that was something like 10 inches long. And about the only real knife fight that Jim Bowie was ever in that we really know about was the sandbar fight. And everyone thinks that it was like a duel with him and some guy with a with a, a cane sword or something. And Jim Bowie got stabbed in the chest and he still wouldn't kill the guy or something like that with his uh, world famous Bowie knife. But the real fact of the matter is there was a duel that happened beforehand that was a nice delightful Louisiana duel. Nobody got hurt, but somebody decided, well, that's no fun. And so they started a, basically a street brawl over the duel that didn't happen. And in that mess, Jim Bowie killed somebody with a big old knife that was basically a butcher knife that he happened to have with him because he was wearing it on his hip because he thought it looked really cool and fancy and everything because he was showing off with his big Bowie knife, which was really a Bowie knife because it was Jim Bowie's knife, which just happened to be a big old butcher knife that he was wearing with him. And the other guy had a cane sword. But anyway, in all that mess up, they don't even know what happened. They, they, all they know is Jim Bowie killed somebody else with his knife. Jim Bowie got stabbed in the chest with this uh, uh, cane sword that broke off. And it hit his sternum and broke. So it was a cheap cane sword. Probably bought in China or something like you know, one of them. You know the one I'm talking about. Cost about 1995, and you can get them from Bud K. That's probably where that cane sword came from. The original Bud K probably sold them that cane sword. So you know what you're getting when you buy a cane sword from Bud K. In any case, he, Jim Bowie supposedly they don't even know was he shot two times and stabbed seven times, or was he shot three times and stabbed four times, or or whatever. Almost killed himself. In the fight, well, didn't almost kill himself, almost got himself killed in the fight, somehow survived, and the newspapers all over the place wrote stories about it, and he became this world famous fighter and uh, ended up moving back to Texas. He had already been living in Texas, that's where he saw the Mexican knives. Now, that's the other thing. This other guy said that those Mexicans probably brought those knives from the Philippines. No, they didn't. Spain. Mexico, Philippines, Spain came all over the place. But long before the Spain got to the Philippines, they were in the Indies. The West Indies, not the East Indies. And they jumped ship. There were Spain, Spanish people who deserted ship. And they met up with French men who deserted ships. And they were living in the islands, having a hog of a time there. And they were hunting with cutlasses. And they found that the cutlasses didn't work too well because they were too big to butcher pigs. And these men were known as boucans, which basically meant smoked meat. And they were boucans. They turned into buccaneers later. That was the French pirates and all that stuff that came out of the Caribbean. But originally they were just known as boucans. And they were basically people who had deserted ship and ended up living among the natives in the Caribbean and they hunted pigs with big swords that had been cut down in the knives. And they were known as boucan knives. And they looked something like this, except they had the hilt of a cutlass on them. And those were the knives that just kind of hung around the Caribbean forever and made their way over to Mexico. Now that is one of the theories. They could have been there even before then, but... Boucan knives were there long before any kind of knife came back from the Philippines back to Mexico. They would have been easier to just hop, skip, and jump right across the Gulf of Mexico from uh, Hispaniola to Florida, Hispaniola to Mexico, Hispaniola to Colombia, all over the place. But you saw cut down sabers that were turned into big old knives. And that was the Boucan knives. And then they later became all sorts of other names. But if anyone is the forefather of the Bowie knife, it would probably be the Boucan knives. 
any case, they came in possibly through Jim Bowie because, well, do we know Jim Bowie's name is attached to the knife now? And Jim Bowie definitely did marry a woman who lived in Mexico, and he was very much into the Spanish culture there, and that's why he wanted the big ass knife. Big ass hunt knife that looked like the Mexican knives. He liked those Mexican knives. But it looked more like this than this. Now story has it, and it is just the story, is that after the sandbar fight, he said, we need to change this and refine it and all this other stuff. Well, in fact, nobody knows anything that Jim Bowie ever said about his knife because everything we've heard about Jim Bowie and his knife came either from relatives after he died or from newspapers or from people who were cashing in on Jim Bowie's name after the sandbar fight and after the Alamo. So everything about the knife is myth. So it really is a mythical knife. We don't know what it really looked like. There's no pictures of it. There's no even drawings of it, except after he died. And if the account is right that after the sandbar fight, he went back and decided this knife doesn't quite work right. I need a heavier blade. I need a guard and all this other stuff. Then the knife he had at the Alamo is not the same knife that he had at the sandbar fight. It's a different knife. And people say he might have had as much as three or four different knives that he just kept changing out. And there's like seven, eight, nine, ten, a hundred different blacksmiths who all claim to have made a knife for Jim Bowie. But what we really know of today as the Bowie knife was mainly made in Sheffield, England. And it's because they said, man, them Americans over there. They're crazy about this guy named Jim Bowie and some kind of big ass knife that he had that he was fighting with and then he died at the Alamo fighting with it. The man was sick in bed dead almost at the Alamo. Two days, you know, that's the other thing. They had this old argument. Jim Bowie and Jim Travis, no one even caught that. His name isn't Jim Travis. You think an expert in a friend of uh, the, the great, 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 great grandson, daughter, mother, father, sister brother of Jim Bowie would know that the man who was there with Jim Bowie was William Barrett Travis, known as Buck Travis. And the two of them supposedly hated each other's guts and they were fighting over who was going to be in charge of the Alamo because both of them were lieutenant colonels. One of them was in charge of the lieutenant colonel Bowie's volunteers and then, uh, uh, Buck Travis, well, he was a lieutenant colonel who was uh, uh, in charge of the Legion of Cavalry as part of the Texas Army. And actually, they were commanded by this guy named Neil, and Colonel Neil, who uh, said, you know, things are looking kind of rough around here. I'm going to go look for reinforcements. Uh, you two sorted out here. And he split and didn't bother to tell which of them was in charge. And so they basically came to a gentleman's agreement and said, we'll just be co-commanders and they ended up saying all right that's fine and they got along well until uh Jim Bowie decided to get himself up and sick probably had hepatitis probably would have died anyway soon because probably drank the wrong water or something like that maybe it was just dysentery and maybe it had just crapped himself to death I don't know but in any case he was sick in bed dying after the second day of the Alamo 13 days so it was a long time and he was in miserable shape by the time the Mexicans showed up. One story has it that the Mexicans actually had to tie, lift him up and tie him to a pole in order to kill him. Because he was in such sad shape and they didn't want to kill a man laying in a bed. So they had to strap him to a pole and tie him up and kill him. I don't know if that's the, the, the story or not. Of course, if you see John Wayne's Alamo, then you see Jim Bowie fighting to death in his bed, shooting at guys and hitting them with his knife and everything else. He made a big deal about his knife in the story, and that's where I wonder about. Anyway, anyway, now we're way, way, way off track. In any case, Buck Travis and Jim Bowie, they had some animosity between the two of them, but nothing dramatic like they make it in the movies and everything. 
and uh, Buck Travis ended up being in charge of it. And there's no way in heck that Jim Bowie would have been able to stand up and uh, sit there and argue with anybody about who had the better knife. We know that. I was joking around about that. I think everyone knows that. Just like the great, 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 great grandson also knows we're just joking around about that. Anyway, with that said, boy, am I, I'm rambling now. Anyway, it goes, well, you know what? Uh, might have been in my medicine earlier. Anyway, this is what most people think of when they see a Bowie knife. And this is nothing like the knife that Jim Bowie would have had, especially at the Sandbar fight, according to all the uh, accounts of the story. It was more like a butcher knife. But this is what most people think of it. And this really comes from Sheffield, England. Not this one. This one's from Baron's son. It's the Gold Rush buoy. And it's a copy of the uh, Western buoy made by the Western 49 buoy made by Western Knife Company or Western Cutlery. But this is really the iconic buoy knife that most people think of. And this is based off of uh, what were often referred to as Sheffield buoys back in the uh, 1850s, 1860s and stuff back in the time of the Civil War. But this is what we think of. is big clip blade, usually a blade that's more than nine inches long, a cross guard, often an S guard, and a stout handle going on there, not stick blade. That's what we think of. Sometimes you'll see them with, a, with the extra support on the back, the brass support on the back. That's especially for a longer blade, like a, oh, let, why not? Let's break out the, the D-guard buoy again. See, here's the D-guard buoy. Got the reinforcing brass strips going on the back there. That's to give extra help holding all that blade in place and everything. This is pinned in there. But, you know, again, big old blade on a knife. And that's what people would think of as a buoy knife. <sighs> had to do it. Just had to do it. Didn't do it to this one yet. Ah! Yeah. That's the other sign of a good Bowie knife. We've mentioned that before. Unless it's double-sided. You never double-sided. Uh, you never mouth-carry a double-sided or double-edged uh, Bowie knife. Just ain't safe. Any case, uh, these were actually, when you see the D-guard Bowies, those were usually just made in the South by somebody. And they might have been made from cut-down uh, sabers. Or they might have also just been crafted like this. Uh, and they usually often just have a, uh, you know, one of them uh, rat tail uh, spines going through there, even with the big blade. But it was all right. It was a hunting knife, and it's really used for, well, it was used for everything. Cutting down trees, cutting up people, ripping out the bellies of, uh, you know, yellow-bellied Yankees, you know, things like that. But they also became popular among the Yankees, too. They'd capture one of these things, and they'd carry it, too. But the funny thing is, is during uh, the Civil War, <laughs> Sheffield was like, man, our, these Bowie knives are really, really uh, catching on over there in uh, this, uh, that uh, colonies over there because they're fighting each other and there's a big demand for these knives. So what Sheffield Cutlers were doing is like on Monday they'd make knives, Sheffield Bowies for the Yankees and then on the... Tuesday, they'd make them for the Rebels, and then on Wednesday, they'd make them for the Yankees, and then on the Thursday, they'd make them for the Rebels, and then on Friday, they'd make them for both sides, and they'd just sell them like crazy until around 1863 or so when the uh, the boycott really kicked in, or the the the, the roadblock, the the what the blockade, the blockade took place, and the and the and them Rebels, they weren't able to get any more of those. Uh, Big ass buoys coming out of Sheffield, and then they said, "Well, you know what? Let's just start making them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for the North, and on Friday we'll make them for the Rebels because we can't get them into there." So that's what they started doing. But most of the buoy knives that we end up seeing were actually made in Sheffield, England, and they really popularized the buoy knife. And this is more or less based off of a Sheffield buoy instead of the knife that Jim Bowie would have been carrying. Except the Sheffield buoys were 
well, they had all sorts of decorations on them, different things. Oh, and that's the other thing. I tell you what, Davy Crockett, he would not have been impressed with Jim Bowie's knife because we actually have an example of a Davy Crockett Bowie knife that was not a Davy, obviously wasn't called a Bowie knife because they weren't being called Bowie knives yet. But we got a big ass Crockett knife that's in museums from before uh, Davy Crockett ever even met Jim Bowie. And that knife is an awesome big old knife. Very impressive. And more in tune to what we think of when we hear Bowie knife than what the Jim Bowie knife looked like. In any case, all I'm trying to get at is there was really nothing that special about Jim Bowie's knife at the time. It's the kind of knife that plenty of people were carrying. And most other people, you know, them frontiermen, they had probably looked at Jim Bowie's knife and said, I wouldn't carry something that big, it just ain't worth the time. Or they'd go, <laughs> my knife's just as good and just as better. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Everybody would carry the knife that, th that suited them. And a lot of them would have said, that knife's just not right. You know, I don't care about no sandbar sandbar fight, nothing like that. You know, and then probably also a lot of people afterwards going, didn't help him a lot there at the Alamo now, did it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say? And this is not a shot at Jim Bowie or anything, or a shot at the Bowie knife, because obviously I must really like Bowie knives. I like big ass blades and the Bowie knife is a classic big ass blade. The thing is, before Jim Bowie, there were big ass blades. During Jim Bowie, there were big ass blades. It wasn't until after Jim Bowie died that big ass blades became Bowie knives. And what's worse is after that, every knife that had a clip on it, any kind of fixed blade knife with a clip blade, suddenly becomes a Bowie knife. So even this knife here is somehow now called a Bowie knife. But look at the difference in size. So just like so many other things, we have cheapened what a Bowie knife is. Kind of makes me sad, but at the same time, I guess it's a big tribute to the man Jim Bowie that if it's a fixed blade knife, it's a Bowie knife of some kind. But in reality, even the knife that most people think of when they think of Bowie knife, it isn't even like the knife that Jim Bowie carried. That's what you call a myth. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I still don't know what I was getting at here. But anyway, I guess I'm going to call it a day because I have definitely rambled on forever in a day. <laughs> Let's see if the editors can turn this into something good. <laughs> Let's get that. Unlike another so-called Bowie knife expert who relied entirely on third-hand unsubstantiated oral traditions from a so-called relative, Skip relied entirely on the published scholarly resources shown here. These resources have been vetted and have been widely accepted in the academic community for years. Alright, <laughs> there you have it all you knife chatters. Been your old pal Skip the Show. Another fun knife Friday in the books. Remember, if your knife's not fun, you're doing it wrong. Skip out. If your knife's not fun, you're doing it wrong, and skip out or register trademarks of Skip to Show Enterprises. This has been a Cap Production presentation. All rights reserved.